Yeah, so I'm going to be talking about our project which began in uh, at the end of 2013 to apply a whole range of different digital technologies to recording and recreating the Weems Caves in, uh, in minute detail. Um, first off, very brief introduction to the site. Weems is from the Gaelic, it literally means the place of the caves. So when you talk about the Weems Caves, you're talking about the caves at the place of the caves. Um, it's a coastal area of Fife, about 30 miles north of Edinburgh, similar distance southwest of St Andrews. Uh, and our survey uh, and our project covered uh, the caves and the buildings along this stretch of coast on a very, very narrow strip of land, uh, just under a kilometre long. But it's a, very, it, it's a strip of land that's extremely rich in, in, in archaeology. Um, there was activity here in the Bronze Age. These are Ard marks, which were found in front of one of the caves, dating to about 2,500 years ago. We also have evidence of grains of barley from within one of the caves dating to around 250 to 400 AD. So it means that we know pretty much that the caves were in constant use right up until the Pictish period. And in the Pictish period, we get these. Now, um, this is just one of the, car the carvings uh, within the caves which fit within the classic Pictish repertoire. And it's worth taking a moment to stress the importance of this. Um, there's about 40 commonly um, found types of Pictish motifs, the core symbols if you like, and 16 of those are found within the, within the Weems Caves. So Pictish beasts, double disc symbols, um, the, 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 uh, the, et cetera, et cetera. And we also have a number of animals, fishes, swans, wolves, wolves, uh, horse, et cetera. And to put, that, put the rarity in context, and this is why it's an important site, is that there are actually only about 60 examples of Pictish symbols within caves in Scotland, and we have 49 of those at, at, at Weems. Um, those 60 <coughs> symbols are spread across eight caves, and again, we have five of those eight at Weems. So really, it is an absolutely uh, important resource for, for, for understanding um, perhaps where some of these, where these symbols came from, how the, how, how the iconography develops. Uh, now, I say it has 49 symbols, it actually still only has 26 because we've lost all the rest um, since they first started being recorded in the middle of the 19th century. We also have a lot of early Christian crosses, probably associated with uh, missionary activity from Iona in uh, around the 7th century, which are very similar to a lot of the crosses in, in Western Scotland. We have a number of other noteworthy carvings of indeterminate date. Um, the, the boat um, is it's been called the Viking boat. There's no reason to believe it's particularly Viking. It could equally be, 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 be Pictish, uh, which would make it one of only two depictions of a Pictish boat in existence. We've got um, what's known locally as Thor and his hammer with his goat, which is probably the least likely explanation for what it actually is. <laughs> and the midget cut marks um, forming a cross shape, which may well be prehistoric in origin and, and could have been later converted into a cross by some of the, some of the early, uh, early Christians. We have the ruins of a medieval castle built by the Macduffs, who are key allies, allies of the kings of Scotland and the earls of Fife. And we have inscriptions left by some of the later inhabitants uh, from when this became a very heavily industrialised coastline late from the 17th century onwards. And we had glass making, coal mining, manufacturing, uh, production of gas, all this took place in, in or, around, or around the caves. And this is an image of some of the names left by visitors to the well cave, which had a holy well inside and in which locals would gather to sing hymns and exchange gifts as part of a Hansel Mundy tradition, a tradition which has pretty much died out, I think, in its entirety within Scotland, but was very strong, particularly in this area. Uh, in the 19th century. Uh, that's not the William Wallace, unfortunately, otherwise we might get a lot more visitors to the caves. It's, it's a William Wallace, and we can actually trace who he was from, 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 from local records. And finally, we even have the ruins of the, 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 the 19th, 20th century gas works, which served the mining communities along the coast. So we have thousands of years of heritage there, um, some of which has, has, is, is of very important national significance. But it sits on a coastline that can do this. Uh, the Ducot that you see there no longer exists, that's long gone, um, and uh, along with a huge section of the coast edge at this point. This is what the gas works used to look like, and this is what it looked like a few years later. So you can see the vulnerability of the coastline and what the, what the, what the elements can do, to, can, 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 can do here. Um, the industrial activity is also taking its toll. Uh, as I said, it was a very heavily mined area. The brick pillars that you can see in this picture were put in by the coal company to try and shore up the caves because the mine shafts went underneath. Uh, the result of that activity changed the water tables and so on. So it's, very, it's created a, a very in, uh, unstable area. Um, this is actually a picture of coal miners surreptitiously, 
surreptitiously gambling uh, when it was illegal away from the, the, the prying eyes of the local constabulary. Um, the brick pillars, though, were unsuccessful because after th this picture was taken, the whole front section of the cave actually collapsed, and, and the part of it is it, the, the front of the cave is now blocked with a huge, a huge pile, of, a pile of rubble. That's not the only collapse we've had. In 1918, um, some of the best carvings that, that existed on the site in what was known as the West Dew Cave collapsed when a coastal battery was placed on top of it and on its first firing brought down the roof of the cave and, and lost, uh, lost, all those, lost all those carvings. More recently, we get this sort of thing. Um, these pictures from the 1980s, uh, three separate burnt out cars, one of which destroyed these, some of the, some of the best symbols that we had in, uh, uh, um, in Jonathan's Cave, swans, Pictish beasts, etc. Shown here uh, from an illustration of 1867, uh, completely gone. And that's why uh, my organisation is the Save the Wheat Ancient Cave Society, because that's still very, very much part of our mission and something that we're absolutely focused on, is the protection and preservation of what we have. But to come to the um, project that we engaged in, as well as building the capacity to, to, to be able to better look after the caves, this is pictures just taken in the last two summers of some of the things that we get. So more burnt out vehicles, um, a fire through, uh, a deliberate fire started in the basement of the castle, graffiti outside and inside the caves, including over some of the carvings. We've been building our capacity all the time to deal better with that. So getting training so that we can remove the graffiti ourselves, enhancing security and so on. But really this explains why we embarked on this project to digitise everything, uh, because it is such a fragile resource and it's, it's, it's under such threat from so many, so many sources. Um, so what we did, um, this is an opportune time for a word from our sponsors. All these people either directly funded the work or gave us assistance in, in, in carrying it out. Um, we embarked on a project to completely digitise and minute and record in minute detail what we actually have on the site. And from the beginning, as Stuart said, that was something that was, the whole idea was it was something that would engage the local community. It's not just professionals coming in and recording it and going away again. It's part of actually building our profile in the locality, building capacity for ourselves to be able to look after the caves and so on. So it was a mixture of archaeologists, enthusiastic amateurs and the wider community that took part in all this. And by the end of it, we produced um, really high quality, accurate baseline data that we can now use to go back to and monitor the condition of the coastline, the condition of the carvings, and, and see what changes are, uh, changes are going on. And it also gave us a very flexible data set from which we built an interactive website to allow users to fully explore exactly what we have on the site. Now, we're not the first people to document the caves, and we're certainly not the first to do so with the best technology of the age. This isn't a historic photo, this is actually a still from a video that we made with a couple of our volunteers playing the part of uh, a local man, John Patrick, and his da daughter Jessie, um, who photographed the caves in 1902, and so we reenacted that and we paid tribute to all the people that have gone before us. And there's been a whole line of people, so um, right back to the, the antiquarians of the mid 19th century, people like Christian McLagan, the pioneering archaeologist, well, one of Scotland's first women archaeologists who made rubbings there, we've had casts taken, we even had um, early use of laser scanning back, uh, as far back as, as 2005. Um, and so we're just really continuing that tradition. Uh, incidentally, no volunteers were harmed in the making of the film, <laughs> despite appearances to the contrary. So this is some of the technology that we employed. Um, in the top uh, left corner is an example of the laser scanning. Uh, we scanned 800 metres of the coastline, eight caves and the ruins of Macduff's castle. Uh, and for those that care about these things, that was used at a Faro Focus X330 laser scanner, um, operated here in the picture by Marcus Abbott of Yat, uh, who, 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 did, who did this work. Um, just a note on the laser scanning. In the top right-hand corner, you can see the relative positions of um, the well cave and what's left of Macduff's castle. And there was a very real threat that we would lose the well cave, that it was going to be filled in uh, with concrete because it was thought to lie directly underneath the remains of the castle and be causing structural instability. So the laser scanning immediately had a, con had a result in that we managed to prove that there was no danger. There's many metres of solid rock between the, the, the cave and the castle. And so we've actually saved it and preserved all that, that, that 19th century carvings that, that, that was it, um, within it. Um, as well as laser scanning, we conducted a photogrammetry survey using both the drone pictured here and also uh, ground photography of the landscape and within the cave, it, the, the, the cave itself. That provided high quality textures for the three dimensional models that, we, that, that resulted from the laser scanning. Um, and altogether, we got 400 gigabytes of, of, of 
data for the, for, from the laser scanning and took over 24,000 images of, of, of the coastline. That gives you an idea of the sort of data, size of the data sets that we're, we're dealing with. For the individual carvings themselves, we used a technique called reflectance transformation imaging. Now, that needs a session in itself to explain really what that is, but for those that are unfamiliar with it, um, maybe I'll take just a very brief detour to, to, to explain it. Essentially what it means is that rather than in a normal image, you just have colour information for each pixel. Uh, under RTI, you actually calculate a function, which then, uh, for, 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 for each point in the, in the image, which changes as you, as you change the, the position of, the position of um, virtual light. Um, and I'll show you some examples of what that allows you to do in terms of looking at close detail. It allows you to simulate raking light, apply different modifications, different functions to increase specularity, reflection and so on, and really bring out details that you can't see with the naked eye. Um, it's actually quite a simple technique. This is our workflow that we developed. You take 36 photos in a sort of virtual hemisphere in front of, a, 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 of, of the, the, the subject. Um, you keep your camera absolutely still and you have a reflective sphere in the image and when you put all that into software that works out from where the light's shining on the sphere, sorry, you, you rotate a flash around the, the virtual hemisphere, it gives you 36 sample points and the software then works out a, a function for each, for each pixel so when you come to view it, look at it on the viewer, you can rotate the virtual light around and it shows you exactly what it looks like. So you can see it under conditions that you never actually even took the photo of in, 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 in the first place. It's a very clever technique and it's ideal for us because it just uses straightforward, um, it, 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 straightforward equipment, standard photographic equipment, free software and after a small amount of training our volunteers managed to, to do all the recording of every single carving uh, at the, at the, along the coast. That said, it was quite challenging because working in a cave conditions where you need to keep your equipment absolutely stable and you've got uneven surfaces, you've got overhanging rock, it, it's not without its problems, but it's something that I think we're very pleased with. And having developed the ability to do that ourselves, we then actually also managed to help other local heritage organisations, graveyards, etc., have a look at some of their ins inscriptions. So it's not only mean that we've recorded our own, it's, 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 it's enabled us to, to, to help other people in the, in the, in the locality. Um, so this is our website, this is the model we ended up with, this is the coast uh, <coughs> model. Um, and we, you're looking there at the coast as it is now, but what we also did is manage, the reason we call it a 4D website is because we introduced the element of time. We used our baseline model to be able to then go back and reconstruct what it would have looked like in the different periods. So this is the, the modern day, you can see the coastline is, is completely degraded. Uh, in 1900, there was more coastline. You've got the gasworks sitting there in the in the corner. Uh, back in the medieval period, the castle at its full extent and a, and a bit more coastline. And then finally, back into the Pictish period, where you had actual farming going on in front of the caves, and we put people living and, and, and working around in in the landscape. Um, Moving on very swiftly, this is uh, one of the panoramas that we created from within the cave. We, we made complete models of five caves and then produced panoramas that you can move around in um, from point to point and examine what's actually in there. So the green highlighted areas are, are live links and you click on one of those and it brings up the high resolution RTI images that we created. So you can actually examine the, 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 each individual carving in, in great detail. So this is an example of what an RTI looks like. So you can't see anything there. There's absolutely nothing there um, to the naked eye. But when you begin to rotate the light source around, you begin to see things coming out. So I don't know if you can see, it's still quite hard to see, but the scrolled, um, if I move the mouse around, that might give you the idea. You've got the scrolled feet there of a Pictish beast. You've got its head up here. And we're not just imagining that um, because we know that's there because it was recorded like that in 1867. So by using this technique, we can bring back to life, if you like, some of the degraded art that, 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 that is, that is, um, that's been lost. Um, the other thing we've managed to do is, because uh, we've got the cave models, we, we, we began to reconstruct the caves themselves as they would have appeared. So this is a view from within inside the court say, cave. You've got the, the brick pillars in the way. Um, there's no light coming in, because off to the right, the entrance is, is largely blocked up by fallen rubble. But have a look at this. This is what happens when you take that rubble away and open up the cave mouse to how, how it were. And from this, we managed to establish definitively that without exception, all the Pictish era, uh, era carvings are on brightly lit walls. These are not things, these are not to be hidden away with only, and, and, and only a select few people to be seen them. These are making a statement and they're highly visible. 
Um, and we've also done that with the collapsed, um, the collapsed West Duke cave. So I need to bring it to an end. Um, this, that's just really a brief overview of some of the content that we've got. Um, we've done a lot, lot more with this as well. We've got, um, in the top left, you can see we've completely reconstructed the, the gas works. We've completely reconstructed Macduff's Castle as it was, and both these feature in videos as animations, fly-throughs to show what they would have looked like in the coastline. Um, top right, we've got the, the reconstructed lost West Dew Cave. Um, we've got historic photographs, we've got, his, we've got antiquarian plans. We've brought together all the references and all the documentation that exists on the caves together into, into one place. So that's 60 RTI files. And the RTI files, the viewer that we adapted to, um, to be able to see them online is actually only a subset of what you can do with the downloadable version. So we've supplied the very high resolution original files that you can download and use on your own desktop to, to apply all sorts of different filters that aren't possible online. So we've made 60 of those available. We've made eight different videos about the history of the site and the history of the, 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 the people that lived there. Uh, we've done the reconstructions. We've got um, about 70 historic images from the antiquarian drawings and, and, and so on. And we've got all the full excavation reports. Absolutely everything that we know about the caves is, is, is on the website. So all in all, we're quite pleased with it. Uh, as you can see, this is us at the launch of our, our website. This is just some of the many volunteers who took part in that. And there's a lot of stuff you don't see. The interviews with local people about what their memories are and, their, their, and, and, and the history of the area. So in 15 minutes, hopefully I've given you some idea of what you can produce with active community engagement, working with professionals um, to, 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 to record the, the heritage that we have and make it accessible to, to, to people from a wide range of uh, backgrounds. And that's the address if you want to check it out for yourselves.